the poems I'm reading tonight are, are really um, concentrating on aspects of those relationships that we understand physically, um, because I think that's what poetry can do best, is communicate through sound and rhythm and syntax and drama. Um, the unspoken things we, we come to understand um, in relationship. So, um, so this is called The Cliff Swallows, and, um, uh, and it is set uh, uh, um, along the Missouri River, and the Missouri breaks between South Dakota and Nebraska, and where they're, they're not as famous as the swallows at Capistrano, but there's an amazing colony of cliff swallows that keep coming back again and again. Nobody knows for how long they've been coming back to this place. Um, but they, to me, a, a sort of a reassuring element of the natural world that you know can kind of put the vicissitudes of human history in perspective. Um, and, and they're cliff swallows, so that when they come, you know, they'll, they'll swarm and then they'll come down all together to their nests, but the nests are, you know, made out of mud and, and the cliffs, so they just sort of, they're just gone when they find their homes there. The cliff swallows, Missouri breaks. Is it some turn of wind that funnels them all down at once, or is it their own voices netting to bring them in? the roll and churr of hundreds searing through river light and cliff dust, each to its precise mud nest on the face. None of our isolate groping, wishing me could be sent so unerringly to solace. But this silk skein flashing is like heaven brought down, not to meet ground or water, to enter the earth and disappear. This is called Grandma Hazel's Lace, and um, actually both of my grandmothers on both sides were, um, came to South Dakota with homestead families. Um, so there are a couple of words in this poem that um, come from kind of making something out of nothing. One is poultice, which is, you know, different cultures make poultices out of herbs or whatever's at hand to, to, for medicinal purposes. And the other is tatting. Um, my grandmother was a wonderful seamstress and quilter and crocheted and all kinds of stuff. But the, the thing that fascinated me most, and I never learned how it was done, was that she did tatting, which is like crocheting. I mean, some of you probably know about it. But, um, but it's not done with a hook. And you can't want, I mean, it's, it's done with this shuttle that sort of shaped like a big long eye and, and the threads inside of it and, and the hand just seems to just do this and suddenly lace comes out one end of it. I was fascinated as a kid watching her make lace. Grandma Hazel's lace. Root craze, carrot frond, tumbleweed wrapped by wind, bloodshot eyes awake after days of dust storm or after nights of hard still gin. Every kind of nothing looped up by her hands and tatted into half-hitched lark's heads, double-stitch, gap, eco, thread wrapped on one hand while the shuttle tipped back and forth, back and forth in the other. Between them, a ring of knots forming, a chain, a wreath, little swath of collar fancy grown, or doily, or edging fit for the bedding of the next bride and groom, who would in turn make something out of nothing in this no man's land. House of sod, doll of washcloth, scrap quilt, poultice of weeds, butter churned from the one cow's givings and molded into rose pats. Goose down pillows, pheasant feather hats, and this magic of laces that we can pick up in our hands, that we watch take shape above her lap. Such handkerchief frills to catch the eye or heart of a prince should ever one pass through these parts. Um, this is uh, an elegy for my mother. <clears throat> window. The window of her last room in the subacute ward, building next door to death, was lovely in the evenings, after visitors had come and gone, after Dad had taken Brad back to the farm and made his last stop in. 
and all the machines and tile faded, the snow outside grew violet, then white against the dark, a steady glow beneath us. I could leave the curtains apart while she slept more heavily with the bigger night dose of morphine, and I gave up reading my Chekhov story. After the first days, she hardly opened her eyes, and the sky had clouded over, so I left it there all the time, that square of world we seemed to have known before, though we'd never been there. Now I pic picture snow stark, definite against the trees, then realize, no, it was just September. Even in South Dakota, an early snow wouldn't stay on the ground that long. Maybe there wasn't any snow, only the pale light and her window altering the way light passed through it. 